Good evening to everyone uh, that has joined us this evening. I'm Norwin Marins, and I'm joined with Bruce Fagan from the Mid-Atlantic uh, region, and we are the chairs of the Webinar and Affinity uh, Programming of the FJMC. And this is one of our keynote programs uh, this evening. We're honored to have Rabbi Noam Raucher, who is the FJMC Executive Director, native of Hamden, Connecticut, product of the uh, Jewish uh, schools in, in that area, including uh, Solomon Schechter, Camp Ramah, USY, uh, Hillel at Hofstra University. Uh, he was ordained at the G uh, Ziegler School of Rabbinic Studies in 2011 and has served as a pulpit rabbi and educator on the East and West Coast, first at Temple Israel in Charlotte, North Carolina, and later at the Pasadena Jewish Temple and Center in Pasadena, California, where he is this evening. He has uh, graciously agreed to join us this evening, and he is going to be presenting a Jewish spiritual structure and practice for men. So it's my pleasure to uh, welcome Rabbi Noam Rauscher. Well, thank you so much. Thank you, uh, Norwin, and thank you, Bruce, for setting this up. I very much appreciate it. Uh, and thank you all uh, for joining us. Uh, this is really wonderful. I'm honored. Uh, I can't begin to tell you how much I enjoy working uh, and partnering with FJMC on any number of different things. Uh, there's always a good laugh and good conversation to be had. Uh, and there's always a wonderful spirit between the guys. And that just makes the work that much more joyful and meaningful for me. So thank you all very much. Uh, we got to this point today. Uh, we got to this point today, but it started several years ago. Um, it's hard for me to pinpoint the exact date, but I think everyone recalls kind of this Me Too era that we went through when we started finding out about all these cases of sexual harassment and sexual misconduct in the office. Uh, and I read an op-ed piece in the New York Times that said that we had encountered a ratchet up moment, uh, a moment in which, you know, the behavior of men was going to be tracked or reported on more frequently. Uh, and so there were going to be answers. There was going to be accountability. Uh, and part of that conversation related to something called toxic masculinity. Uh, and that's a real buzzword that we hear today. It's flown, floated all over social media. Young people talk about it all the time. It's something to be abhorred. Um, let me just say from the outset, I don't believe men are inherently toxic. I believe that I don't believe women are inherently toxic either. I believe that each gender as a result of living in a larger culture takes on certain stereotypical traits that are unattractive or unhealthy, that are particular to their gender, right? Only men do certain things, only women do certain things. I'm not saying it has to be that way. I'm saying that's the way it observably is as research has shown us. Nonetheless, this idea of toxic masculinity has crept into the lexicon and it's made things somewhat uncomfortable to me a man. You have to wonder about whether or not you really are behaving the right way, even if you are. Uh, and nobody's gonna tell you these things either. I know that one of the things that, you know, I'm afraid of when I work in an office, and this is particularly, you know, made easier by working with FGMC as being the only employee. But prior to that, it was a concern that, you know, even friendly behavior between men and women could be misread as the wrong thing. And then the next thing you know is that, you know, she would feel unsafe and that I would be labeled as some type of sexual harasser and I wouldn't want anything like that. I'm sure there are a lot of men out there that wouldn't want anything like that either. Nonetheless, that doesn't mean that there aren't objective behaviors that are toxic and problematic in larger society. Um, and I think that men in particular have been suffering under what we call a patriarchy as much as women have. Um, we have both bought into it, both genders, because it affords us a certain amount of power, particularly power that's located at cis white gender men. Um, and so this opportunity, or at least this class that we're talking about right now, is a way to at least, um, well, rebuff those stereotypes. I think we're coming to a moment of great awakening, at least men are, and I certainly know women are, but uh, I know that we're coming to a moment of great awakening when men in this country realize that the invisible patriarchal structure of what it means to be a man doesn't suit them anymore. The idea of being a lone wolf, doing things by yourself, or acting like John Wayne with the John Wayne syndrome as if you feel no pain or experience no pain, or that you're accept or that you're expected to be a sole provider all the time, right? And never get off this hamster wheel of productivity and work for rest and relaxation. 
We know that men are primarily vulnerable with one another, which is why we have to set up things like HMV and support groups for men to find time to talk with each other and build relationships. Uh, and we also know that men don't really take care of themselves in the right ways that they should, which is why we have wellness initiatives run through our organization, right? Men in particular, we get a message that we're supposed to be strong and stoic and we're not supposed to have any problems and we're supposed to have all the answers and fix things. Unfortunately, that leads us down a really unhealthy road in life. And it means we're missing in our relationships, we're lacking in those. Uh, and it's been reported that there is a friendship recession amongst men and that there is also uh, a loneliness uh, epidemic that men are feeling and all this impacts our health and well-being over the longitude of our lives. Uh, and so what we're going to take a look at is um, what Judaism has to offer in terms of a way of leading a healthy lifestyle as a man with regard to certain values that I believe, A, make us men, but also, also make us good human beings who contribute back to humanity in a pro-social way. That is to say, a pro-social way that builds relationships and builds things and creates things in society rather than breaks relationships and destroys things in society. Um, so what I'll do right now is I'll share the presentation that I have and we will review this uh, structure. What's this about? I'm really taken by Parshat Lech Lecha, particularly what God says to Abraham, go. And we all know that there's a weird grammatical phrasing here, Lech Lecha means go to yourself or go for yourself. It just doesn't mean go, right? This is a special mission that God is sending Abraham on, right? One that he really doesn't know what the benefit is for or what's going to come out of it. But nonetheless, Abraham has to go and explore for himself and ask certain questions of his life. And as we know, at the end of that journey, he's a changed man, right? He comes out not only Abram, but now he comes out as Avraham, right? The idea being that he gets a hay in his name, the hay signifying God, meaning that he's a little bit more divine now, or at least has a greater sense of meaning and purpose in his life. And so he's now Avraham and not Avram. I think a lot of mythopoetic scholars would label that the hero's journey, right, in a real small form. And the hero's journey is something that was popularized and noted by Joseph Campbell and the hero who has a thousand faces, this idea of a character who leaves something that is familiar to go to something that is unfamiliar, an abyss or a low place of some kind, or on top of a mountain, and he encounters a challenge of some kind, and then he comes back different right, to share his bounty with everyone else. That's exactly what happens here with Abraham. By the way, that's exactly what happens with Jacob when he wrestles, wrestles the angel. We have a departure, right? The first stage, Abraham is literally told from God to leave what he knows to be familiar, okay, and venture to something unknown. And in that time, he goes through a challenge. He's down in Egypt and he needs to figure life out. And then there are other problems with his cousin along the way. But nonetheless, when he returns, he gets a new name. And so here we have the hero's journey playing out in our Torah, in the Abraham narrative, as much as we have it playing out in the Jacob narrative. And we could go over those texts more specifically. I'm giving it to you in summation to let you know that what we're talking about is each man today has the opportunity to go on his own internal hero's journey. He has the opportunity to leave behind ways and habits and behaviors that are not suiting him anymore and to challenge himself to grow and return to his family and community new and renewed in beautiful ways that he can really contribute. So let's take a look at this. Urgency in the stats. Nearly half of men say their online lives are more engaging and rewarding than their offline lives. That's kind of scary. More of the youngest men or more of the youngest men uh, trust online misogynist influ influencer Andrew Tate than they do President Joe Biden, 15%. And if you don't know who Andrew Tate is, you might want to ask your grandkids, particularly the young boys, to see if they've seen him on social media. They might be able to name him. But this is a guy who was recently arrested for sex trafficking. On top of his tons of other misogynistic things he puts out there about what it means to be a man and how you should treat women. And only 22% of men have three or more people in their local area that they feel close to or depend on. That's only 22%. Let's also talk about men and friendships. 48% of men report feeling satisfied with friendships. So that's pretty good. It's about half, but it's not hopeful. One in five men said that they had gotten emotional support from a friend in the past week compared to four in, ten, four in 10 women, right? Women do a much better job at supporting one another, particularly emotionally. And people who we know, these are the results. People who we know are socially isolated have 32% higher chance of dying early compared with those who don't experience social isolation. 
FJMC can be a response to all of this. And that's one of the reasons why I love this job. That's why I saw it was an opportunity, knowing everything that happened with, you know, the Me Too movement and my involvement in men's work since then, right? And trying to get more involved and develop a, you know, a voice for this sort of thing. I realized that FJMC is perfectly poised for this. We have an opportunity. We have a community of men that's connected to other communities of men. And we come from an authentic faith tradition that can light, that can lead us in beautiful ways to find meaning in our lives, particularly when we find challenges. Now let's take a look at the structure. What I'm using is Hillel's structure. If I'm not for myself, who will be for me? If I'm only for myself, what am I? And if not now? I believe these are questions that all human beings ask of themselves at one point in their life. They are existential questions and what they address are the primary ways by which we carry ourselves. We think of ourselves and we also think of other people. And surely some people are more one way or the other. They're more sacrificial and they think of others in their lives or they're more self-centered and they don't think of other people in their lives. But nonetheless, what we're talking about is how you walk in this world and how you relate to other people as well as yourself. And also the timing by which you take action, because it's not only the people that we deal with in our lives, it's also the choices that we have to move forward if we so choose. So if I am not for myself, if I am not ready to lead myself, which is something that was required by all human beings, we have to be able to lead ourselves. Nobody will lead us unless we're a community, that's a different thing. But in terms of our own lives, we're the only people that can lead them and we must feel empowered and responsible for those lives. And so with that, who will be for me, right? We're asked the question in Genesis from God, Ayeka, where are you? And we know that's not a geographical question. That's an emotional, that's a spiritual question. Do you enjoy where you are in your life? Are your relationships satisfying to you? Are you getting meaning and pleasure from your work? Where are you? Do you feel like you're failing all the time? Where are your friends? Are you finding any value in your life either? These are major existential questions that we're called on to ask ourselves, I would argue, at least once a year during Yom Kippur, Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. But nonetheless, I would say this is a spiritual practice that men should be asking themselves on a daily basis, if not weekly. Okay, so this is Ayeka. Where are you? Do a check-in with yourself. What's going on in your life and are you happy with it? Is it bringing you meaning and joy? And if it's not, what are you going to do about it? Are you going to say hineni, which is the response that all of our answers has given to God when God says, Ayeka, here I am. I stand ready to take on the responsibility to lead my own life. No one else is responsible for me. No one else will do it for me. I want the big house and the fancy car. I will go do it myself. I want the family and the friends surrounding me. I will build that myself. But no one else will do it for me. And I will take responsibility for my actions. Here I am st standing ready to take accountability for my actions. And then the Sitra Akra. This is where I touch on a little bit of Carl Jung. Carl Jung talks about the idea of the shadow, the parts of ourselves that are unknown that we don't often shed light on, but come out in different ways, most likely when it's unexpected and have a tendency of doing real damage, even if they can be some ways to, to keep us safe and protect us. But for each Jewish man to explore the concept of the Sitra Akra, which is an Aramaic phrase, which is what we believe that Jacob wrestled with when he wrestled the angel. That it may have been an angel, a divine being, but what it may have also been was his darker self. The part of his self that was a deceiver, that was a manipulator, that took people for granted, that, that lied and that stole from people and that took advantage of people. And the wrestling match he has is one that I would argue every Jewish man has to take at least once in their lifetime. After, after getting asked the question of Ayeka, after stepping forward and saying Hirnani, then they wrestle with the parts of themselves that they don't want to encounter anymore, that they want to slough off and grow something new like a beautiful butterfly. But it takes the wrestling match. You have to get down in the dirt, right? That's where we get the limp. The limp signifies that we're different. We might be limping, but we're also stronger from the experience. And we get a new name, both like Avraham and Jacob did. Who will be for me? I will be for myself. But if I'm only for myself, what am I? What am I if I'm only for myself? We need a minion. We need to have a group, a community of men by which we go to that is divine by Achva, brotherhood. And we get that idea of minion from Sodom and Gomorrah, that being the only group of righteous people that God would have permitted to allow the 
city to stay. That's what we need, that small righteous group, which happens to be a great number of men for a support group as well. Whether it's a minion and you're praying, supporting each other spiritually, or whether it's an HMV or other ways for men to gather, it's an opportunity to be part of a community to recognize that you're not alone and that you don't have to be alone. And one of the greatest sins that our tradition has to offer, at least reminds us about, is that of separating ourselves from the community. That's why we allowed driving on Shabbat in the 1950s, is because otherwise, with suburban sprawl, people would not have been able to go to synagogue if the rules were you had to walk there, or you couldn't light a fire to do so. It's about being part of a community, and we need to actively seek it out. Men cannot do it alone. That's why we end up with so much lone wolf behavior because we think we have to take it on alone when reality is community is right there for us. But within the community, we have to find a Rav, find a teacher and acquire a friend, just like it teaches us in, in Pirkei Avot, someone who has wisdom greater than ourselves, someone who can mentor us. If you read the articles that are coming out right now, a lot of people will say that one of the deficits that men face is that they don't have mentors. Literally, I'm not even talking about like career-wise mentors. I'm talking about like men who can show them what it is to be a man when you encounter certain things. In Judaism, we have the bar mitzvah, but even that doesn't really show them. We say you're a man, you're not. I know this because my son just went through it. You're on the road to manhood. There's still so much more you have to learn and you need mentors and guides along the way who are gonna carve that out for you and show you. And in the process, I guarantee you will acquire a friend. And we also need a chavruta. Right, Our tradition has come up with this great concept that you never study alone. You're not allowed to study alone. Even during Passover, you're not allowed to do Passover really alone. You're supposed to ask questions of one another. And the only exception is if you have to do it alone, you still have to ask, ask questions of yourself. Questioning is huge. Challenging ourselves and our preconceived notions right, is enormous in how we lead a positively critical lifestyle, how we make our way in this world and discern the baloney from the reality, particularly everything that's on social media. When you think about, you know, all the men who find more meaning in their social media lives than they do in their actual lives lived out in reality, right? Having a chavruta and finding a community and having a team is actually really crucial to that. Not only because it gets you out from behind your computer and your phone and interacting with other people, but also because it challenges all the notions that that blind algorithm is just sending you, right? That's manipulating you. Rachel Lakish and Rabbi Yochanan were a great chavruta that challenged one another. And the unfortunate thing is their story is also a cautionary tale. They get to the point of challenging each other so much that they start taking it as insults, right? And their relationship dissolves and one of them actually dies because he's just so upset at what happens. And so the relationship breaks down. But what we have is actually a wonderful example of two men right? In the height of their masculinity, one is a great sage and one's considered a great thief, right? They're the manliest men around. And yet they come together to push and challenge each other. But what happens when it's not guided by a certain amount of sanctity and love between them is that it breaks down and they go from being strangers, literally to family and marrying into each other's family, unfortunately to enemies. And we have an opportunity to change that. Men have a great opportunity to really work together if we challenge each other in the right ways with the right type of guidance through a community and through a teacher. If not now, when and how? This stuff happens in tefillah, right? Giving guys an opportunity to do reflective prayer. Let's remember that tefillah comes from the infinitive lehit palel, that's reflective, okay? That means that um, you have to pray to yourself in some ways. You have to make yourself hear what you're saying. If you don't like the fact that there are sick people in the world, well, then what are you gonna do about it? Are you gonna go by their bedsides? You don't like the fact that there's homelessness in the world? Are you gonna step up and provide clothes to those who are naked, right? If you don't like the fact that people are grieving, are you gonna find a place within yourself to offer compassion just like God would? God would do all those things. Can you act in a godly way to bring that type of love to our world? And prayer tefillah should be one of the reflections for that. It should absolutely be. And I believe that prayer can be executed in different ways, right? It's not only through the traditional way, but it is through a way of open communication with a partner. There's a beautiful story in the Talmud uh, when we talk about Hannah, who is the quintessential, the archetype of what it means for Jewish prayer. Hannah's in the Talmud, the, the rabbis say that Hannah is praying unto herself. She's mumbling her lips. 
the priest who's there thinks she's drunk and that's why she's mumbling. But what the rabbis really assume is that she's uh, she's uttering one of the most sacred prayers, a prayer that came from her heart. And it's not, by the way, blessed are you, Lord or God, ruler of the universe for doing this, X, Y, and Z. And it's not Shema Yisrael, and it's not the Amidah. What Hannah prays is, I want a baby. And what am I if I don't have a baby? That is my existence. I came into this world to mother a child. I have arms to hold it and breasts to feed it and a love to love it and a heart to love it with. And yet I can't have a baby. And Hannah, in that moment, what the rabbis are saying, given, granted, it's a male perspective on what women are praying for, but what they're tapping into, right, is this existential grief that Hannah feels, this crisis about not being able to have a baby. And what does that mean for who she actually is? What is the meaning in her life? And I would argue men need men need those opportunities too. And so prayer for us is not just the traditional put on your tali and feeling and open the book, but it is also getting together and sharing with one another about what's really going on and the way we feel about things and how we can be supportive for one another. But it's not only about that. It's also about tshuva. It's also about the practice of taking accountability and making amends. We often talk about this idea, most likely during Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. I'm telling you guys, this is a daily, if not a weekly practice, right? The idea of saying, yeah, I did that and I'm responsible for that and I can make it right. I can't begin to tell you how empowering that is, even if it's for the small things, even if it's you forgot to call someone, right? Rather than coming up with some excuse, right? Just saying, yeah. That's on me and I can do better next time. That's what we're talking about, taking responsibility. And then there's Thaka, right? Obviously, this comes from Yom Kippur and the Unatana Toka, Rosh Hashanah and the Unatana Tokef, right? What annuls the decree, Tfila, Tshuva, and Staka, restorative justice, ways of making our world a better place. With these opportunities to do an introspection, with the opportunities we have to find community. And with the opportunities we have to make right the things that we've done in our in uh, things that we've done wrong in our lives, to bolster our relationships, to lead with vulnerability in that way, I believe we are giving men a structure by which they can lead a healthy and meaningful lifestyle and contribute back to the world in pro-social ways. That's my presentation, gentlemen. I'm happy to take whatever questions or ha or people have. I think. We have a queue set up. People wanted to raise their hands. That would be really helpful. So how does this, um, an example of two, how do parts of this directly relate to things that we're doing or should be doing? Yeah, so Men's Club. I appreciate that, David. Thank you. Um, some of this stuff we already do, right? We already offer mentorship, right? We have a sense of community, right? Making minions and things like that. Um, I think some of this is about using the language deliberately which is to say, this is what FJMC men do, right? FJMC men, we take opportunities for introspection. When we hear that call, Ayeka, we answer with Hineni, and we ask ourselves about who we really are, right? And if we're living the lives we really want to live. Um, and I would also suggest that it requires us to find a minion, right? A place where we can find community beyond prayer, but a group of men by which we can go to and share of ourselves, and in that way, we can find people in the community. We encourage men to not only find a chavruta, one man in the community they find really close with, and we'll go to them with challenging questions to say, I need you to work this out with me. Can I call you at 10 o'clock at night if I'm faced with a problem with my wife or my kids, and I don't know what's going on, and I need someone to turn to? That's the type of chavruta I'm talking about. Someone who will get to a deeper level of truth with you through life's greatest and scariest scenarios. And in that way, we can also be teachers to one another. Each one of us can also be a Rav. You can find another man by which, who you really look up to to give you a sense of wisdom. The Chavruta might be a pair, but the Rav is someone who gives you wisdom, right? Chavruta is a peer for that matter, and the Rav is someone who gives you wisdom. Um, but then there's also the elements of creating opportunities for men to do that reflection through Tzfilah and to take accountability through Tshuva and also to do something about it through Tzedakah. And I believe that HMV is a great place to start. I think we may need to alter it in certain ways to open up the conversation a bit or create another model that enables men to come and gather. Um, and what's really important in all this is that really what it does is it helps to bolster relationships with one another. It really does. When you take accountability for a mistake that you've made, you're saying to a friend, I realize that I didn't come through for you in the way that I was supposed to. And that's on me. 
And now what I'm going to do is make it right in some way. And that builds the relationship. And I do believe that society is generally waiting for men to step up and lead with accountability and vulnerability, to share our, of, our, of ourselves in a way that really connects with people, right? To show that we are human and that we make mistakes, but that we are here to grow and take responsibility for those things that we can. There's been a great drop off in that. People have a very difficult time trusting uh, institutions in America and leaders in America, primarily because they're not taking accountability. I can't tell you how many politicians and celebrities I see obfuscating responsibility, but then putting themselves right in the spotlight for something else. It's up to us. It really is. It's up to us as Jewish men who have a tradition by which we were told to be a light amongst the nations to use the values that we have to lead healthy lifestyles that will contribute back to society. And that's what I'm trying to show us. Really, that's what I'm trying to show us. Yeah, we have an opportunity for that in HMC, uh, excuse me, uh, uh, FJMC. And we have an opportunity to do those things at our conventions or, or our retreats on a regional and national level. I've spoken about this before, that those need to be opportunities. Local level is one thing, but on a regional and national level, we need time solely for men to gather. I love women, and this is not coming from a misogynist place or a chauvinist place, but we need pace, excuse me, we need spaces solely for men to gather without the introduction of women. Women inherently change the conversation and that's okay. But if we're gonna talk about things as guys, if we're gonna talk about things by which we can be vulnerable to one another and really get down to it and say things like, guys, my penis hasn't worked in years. What can I do about it? And to know that nobody else in the group is gonna laugh at you, right? Or think less of you as a man because that hasn't happened is crucial is absolutely crucial to have a sacred environment by which we share those things is necessary. It will allow us to build those intimate relationships that we can share with one another and also create healthier lives for each other. So um, excellent presentation. Uh, you know, it's estimated that about 70% of men at some point will experience what they call to be imposter syndrome. Yeah. And uh, is frequently associated with loneliness and one thing that um, you might expand upon is the consequences of loneliness. Um, well, yeah, particularly within the in the case of imposter syndrome, right? If you think you're not worthy enough, you're probably not going to seek people out um, by which you could find that type of love and community. One of the things I think we have the ability to offer, particularly without women present, um, is to remove ourselves from those labels. One of the things that I really enjoy about my men's group is that my job doesn't matter. My age doesn't matter. Neither does my political affiliation in any way, right? Nothing like that. Not even my last name matters, okay? Or where I come from. I just show up as a guy. My Part of my argument with women present there is that they also look at men as providers, right? And not being able to do that could thwart someone's ability really to connect. And then that imposter syndrome comes back again. Am I really a man? And I don't feel like it. Well, the fact is you are, regardless if you have a job or not regardless if you're providing for your family or not. And you deserve to be seen that way, seen by other men who can see you that way. I'd be curious to see this presented as a um, kind of the way that FGMC did with the inclusion um, initiative as a combined vision statement and resource guidebook. Because so I think some of what you uh, expounded, we do currently have within our current programs, but it would be great to kind of integrate them within this uh, structure that you provided the spiritual structure with, um, you know, kind of going back to our sacred texts. I would also be interested uh, to see where you think and, um, you know, any any other people that might work with you on this and other guys, um, where you think we could develop uh, individual and uh, club programs to further develop and further uh, kind of extrapolate what you're envisioning here. Thanks. I, it's Scott, I really appreciate that. Uh, I think it's a great idea. And you're right. Yeah, we already do a lot of this stuff. It's about, I think, coalescing it into some type of real track or something, right? A way of saying, this is how we think you get from A to Z. And this is the stuff that's really important to do so. Yeah, great question. Great suggestion. And thank you, Rabbi. This was very informative. On Sunday, we heard a, pr a presentation from Sirocco Hospital in Israel on the front lines. We heard the uh, director general, the head of the hospital, and also a psychiatrist. He was a male, she was a female, and Dr. Mandel asked them, how are you coping? And she had set up an entire network of people. She was meeting with 
with her friends. She was doing all kinds of things. He was very much concerned with how the hospital was running, keeping keeping the the uh, everybody going, keeping morale high, and all of that. And he said, you know, I have a friend who is a retired psychiatrist, and every once in a while, I'll give him a call. I thought it was it really amplified what you're speaking about that we don't often know how to take care of ourselves and in taking care of ourselves, then we can take care of others. And, you know, what recommendations do you have to how we can do that? I appreciate that. So I think some, yeah, a lot of that's contained within this, you know, one of the things I didn't talk about was like care of self in the sense of like having, you know, a healthy lifestyle of a, of a, a, a healthy diet, right. And as an example in that way, um, but you're you're also right, Tom, in the sense that men and women approach uh, problems differently. Um, one of the benefits of being a woman is that you're really capable of setting up a social network. I don't know any woman that doesn't have at least two, ch you know, uh, chat groups that she's on on a regular basis, talking with her friends about stuff, whether they're joking around and just bonding or going to each other for serious questions. They're on it, looking at them. Um, Gary told me that there's a, I think, a Shabbat WhatsApp group or something like that. Everyone should be on that. Everyone should be just talking. Everyone should have their own chat groups by which they're just saying, how's it going, guys? And check it in with one another. That's a way, by the way, that you keep the energy alive between events, but also set up that small networking group. Um, we could equally be doing things like those um, by creating those opportunities for men to network on a regular basis. I believe that a lot of the things that I've laid out in the presentation, whether they are you know, guidelines for men so we can check in with one another to say like, you know, are you doing some form of introspection? Are you responding with Hineni in some way? Is that part of the language that you have in how, in how that you carry yourself? Do you have a Haruta partner, right? Are these things that we expect of the men in our community because we believe about, you know, the lifestyle that it will put them on, or at least the track it will put them on to building better relationships with one another, which is really the key to having a long life. That's what the Harvard research says. The key to a successful life, or at least a happy and meaningful life, is the quality of our relationships. And what we're talking about is giving men the opportunity to build those, whether they're through first an introspection and then bringing it to other guys, or just in community in general, but it's about building those relationships. Um, I really, yeah. really liked that presentation. Um, I was particularly touched by how you connected these really contemporary issues that men are struggling with our ancient texts. I'm going to get back to that at the end of my, my comments. Building relationships is what we do very well here in the FJMC. That being said, my almost 30-year-old son was incredulous about a few months ago that we're not drowning in new members since connecting men is one of the three pieces of our taglines, current tagline, community, learning, innovation, and community. This begs the, convent, the, the question, why aren't our conventions and retreats flooded with people? HMV is one tool that we use that connects men for a night, maybe a little bit longer if you do it for a longer period of time. We form groups of leaders at, at the regional level, at the international level, at our club level as well, and men connect for a, a terms of, of their leadership period. My, my question for this group, and not just for you, Rabbi Rauscher, is, is are there other ways in which we can create lasting, in-depth, meaningful relationships? And I'm gonna give one example, and then I'll, I'll pose the, the, the question again. Uh, Benny Sommerfeld and I get together along with a few other men and a couple of women as well in our synagogue. We together, get together every Saturday morning. Y you were there joining us one morning and we study. In the past, we studied Pirkei Avot. In the past, we studied, and now we're currently studying Tehillim. We've connected with each other over these ancient texts. But more importantly, we really look forward to seeing each other. And, and we talk to each other. And, and if we may read one sentence of text. And then instead, we're talking about our lives and our struggles and this and that. Tech study might not be for everyone on this call. I get it. And that's not a problem. But my question, the ultimate question I have is, what are other things we can do? And it's not just for you, Robert Rauch. This is for all of us on the call. What are other ways we can build lasting, deep connections with guys? It's a great question to post to the group, Gary. It really is. Um, let me say in particular, you know, at to your point, one of the last questions, I'm just going to post them here. I know that other people have questions too. There were some questions that came in earlier. Um, the last one is how do we attract younger men to join FJMC? Part of what I'm encouraging us to do is to drop the word younger and just think new, right? I mean, I think that's part of your point, Gary, is that we want more guys. 
right? Inherently within that is the age, right? Because we want guys who have young kids as well. We believe we have something to offer for them, but to focus more on the word new. Um, I there There's a real energy out there for men's communities. And unfortunately we have an upward battle because I think people naturally go to the notion of, well, it's a locker room. Why would we want to support another locker room or fraternity where misogyny and chauvinism is going to not only be birthed, but thrive in some way. That's not what we're talking about. What we're talking about is an environment by which men hold each other in check in a non-shameful and non-judgmental way about reminding each other about, you know, what is our highest potential and what we're really capable of. And in doing so, I believe you honor the relationships that you're in, right? You invite men to be part of those relationships. We have something that we could do that's really exciting. And if we do the research, I think, to look at the other men's organizations that are out there that are creating opportunities for men to come and gather and to find some form of spiritual growth, we'll learn a lot from them. But they're creating those opportunities and young men are flocking to them. I thought it was an excellent presentation, but the one thing that really caught my ear was when you talked about 48% of men have a better or more meaningful relationship online than they do in person. And that group, how are we going to get them to come to a synagogue, much less to a men's club function? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I'm going to say something that I don't think a lot of people are going to like, but I think synagogue affiliation is hamstringing us. Um, we know that only 30%, 33% of Jews or so really affiliate with synagogue life. So I'm curious to know where the other 70% are and what they're doing. And if you want those other men, you're right. If they're not coming to synagogue, then we're not going to get them there. But if we want those other men, we have to figure out where they are and go there. Um, yeah, simply to say, well, most of you or some of you know my story, which is simply that uh, in Montreal, uh, most of the men's clubs uh, and certainly all of the FJMC men's clubs fell apart because the municipality that's the Jewish suburb organized a municipal men's club, which has had roaring success and has 700 members and is doing many of the things that we are talking about here. And for whatever reason, I have not gone on to join that men's club, although sometimes I think I should. And I've realized that um, if you're looking for activities that can bring people together, they're there. And I, I, I've i been involved with two, actually, that I'm in a creative uh, writing group. We meet weekly. We used to meet online, but after COVID, we now meet face to face at the Jewish Community Center. And we have become solid, good friends mm -hmm. who see one another for more than simply our two hours a week of uh, reading our own work. Uh, the other thing that I did, and again, these are just suggestions, but that's what would happen at the conventions where people would 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 make these suggestions and some of them work. Uh, I got a grant for my synagogue um, from a, a heritage network um, and we got money to rework our archive, go into the records of the synagogue and work the archive. And then we did a presentation of the history of the synagogue in relationship to the development of the community. And it worked. I mean, there was a group of people, we all felt more useful at the end of it. And I'm not saying that any one of these activities would work, uh, but one of them might. And that's what the Federation is for, is to get this kind of information distributed around the nation. Thank you, Norman. You know, I think one of the challenges that we have is, to put it tritely, showing that we're not your father's men's club, right? I mean, we face this challenge in trying to, to do the positive things that you are uh, talking about and having this image that men's clubs are patriarchal, exclusive organizations, you know, and trying to break into uh, or reestablish clubs at congregations in our in our region, for example, we run up against this issue that congregations that can consider them progressive, themselves progressive, might have a men's a sisterhood. 
to support women because they should be supported in but but a men's club no way you know right, right. um it's out and, of the question we know what's going to happen there and so you have a great message to get across but we can't it's hard to get our foot in the door even Very to much so. promote that message you know so how how do we <laughs> You know, how do we approach that? I, th that's going to take a real strategic approach. We're going to need to have a game plan for that. We're going to need a, I, I think it, it's actually really useful to approach, I think, a marketing firm to at least get an idea of what that strategy can look like, because we also need to project that message outside of our own community. Like it's one thing to project it within the conservative movement. I think we know where that's going to go, but we want guys outside of it. We have to find a way to advertise outside of the synagogue community. I I appreciate it very much. Um your uh your presentation today it's very powerful and, and moving mm -hmm. certainly one that i'll be thinking mm -hmm. on for uh, for you. a while coming forward um fjmc recently sent along an article i'm going to drop the uh the article i'm referencing in the chat here it includes this quote it's, it's pretty short uh the difference between male and female friendships is often characterized as side by side versus face to face relationships when men meet with friends they stand shoulder to shoulder at the bar at the football grounds fishing at a river. When women meet up, they often sit across a table from each other and talk. I hear you advocating for more face-to-face -face relationships, and I'm curious if that is, in fact, your intention and, and what your thoughts are uh, on those types of relationships. Yes, absolutely. I appreciate you asking that question. It's entirely face-to-face. -face. I won't discount you know, the usefulness of digital life and social media and how that saved us all during the pandemic. Um, I would argue, though, that the pandemic is one of the reasons why we all need to get back out there and find communities again and be with one another face to face. Um, there's a stat that actually points out that teen pregnancies and sexually transmitted infections are down. Um, it's because the kids aren't getting together with one another. You know why they're not getting together? Because they're spending all their time on their phones and that's where they're chatting. But well, I don't think that I think the quote here is more about like I, I realize that, but what I'm oh, saying, okay. all right, cool. what what I'm saying is jump the gun. Um, this is part of the digital life stuff, right? The digital life stuff is a hindrance, right? Sure, STIs and teen pregnancies are down, but it's at the cost of people not actually being with one another, right? The only way that you get pregnant is by being in the same room with someone, to say the least, right? So like you need to like something's got to give and we can give men the opportunity to break away from that, right? There's something more attractive than your social media life and what's going on on Facebook. But that being said, yeah, um, a lot of it also has to do with men um, needing to have FaceTime with one another. One of the things we practice in my men's group is simply standing across from another man, looking him in the eye. That's considered a threatening thing for other men, right? Either you're going to fight him in some way or you think he's going to hit on you in some way. Right. And so men have a tendency of avoiding that, of standing shoulder to shoulder, right, and having conversations when you can't actually look intimately at someone, which is the way women do it. They face each other face to face and they talk about real things. Caitlin Moran in her book, What About Men, points out that when women talk about their feelings, men only banter and banter can save, you know, the uncomfortable silence from time to time, but it doesn't actually build a relationship. She gives an example of how, you know, uh, one of her friend's husbands went to go have you know, coffee or something like that with um, one of his friends who was, you know, the husband of one of her friends. And throughout the entire time they talked, but they didn't talk about like the health of his father. Like it just wasn't shared amongst them because all they did was banter. They didn't really talk about the things that were really going on in their lives. Well, first of all, Rabbi, wonder, wonderful presentation. I think you've you've sort of made us all think more deeply about what we should it could be doing and i think this will lay, lay the groundwork for a lot more discussions uh both in person as well as virtually i just wanted to share that that organically a, a handful of people got together well before covid in my community there are 10 or 12 guys we got together we decided to start having a night once a one, once a week to go out for a beer 10 nice. 12 guys maybe 14 guys over time we've we've developed these very deep relationships it's not just the beer the beer's there but it's really not why we're there we're there to have conversations with each other sometimes we talk eight or ten guys are talking at the same time sometimes guys are just bouncing ideas back and forth i think part of the key though is is and i think somebody mentioned this in the chat too with our affinity groups you want to find people guys in this case that you have something in common with whether it's a beer or a golf game or a, a hardship and if you're willing to be open and you're with a, a handful of people that feel similar, you will develop relationships over time. I guarantee it. 
you're right. But let me also argue that part of the beauty of these is that you can bring guys who are complete strangers together and have them form relationships, which is also crucial, right? Mm -hmm. Affinity groups are good. They're a natu nice, natural way to gather. At the same time, they don't a necessarily welcome in strangers because they feel cliquish in some way, even if you are, you know, of the affinity. But two, right, those aren't also deliberate spaces why, where men are engaged and challenged to be serious with one another and ask each other challenging questions. Those are nice social activities and, and they should have them. Absolutely. We need them. But we also need spaces by which could, men can look at each other and say, hey, man, like uh, uh, you did something before and that wasn't good and I need to talk to you about it. Right. Or you hurt me in some way and we need to clear the air about this so it doesn't fester. And that doesn't really happen at the sporting events. I don't really have a question, but your, your presentation really got my mind working. Uh, I am probably older than everybody that's on this thing here. And uh, my last couple of years has been kind of what could be a lonely year, uh, losing my wife and all that. But if not for the friendships that I developed through men's clubs, I don't know where I would be or what I would be doing today, uh, both my health and my mind. Uh, it, it developed friendships and, and it, it just must have come naturally. I don't know how this came about, but it's it's just the being together, being a, able to talk with men uh, at, the, at our meetings, whatever it was, uh, friendships have developed uh, and as these men get older and they're going to start to realize that it, it's an important part of life because loneliness can be terrible. And I had a little bit of it in the beginning. And uh, if not for some of my men's club friends, uh, I don't know where I would be. I owe a lot to my men's club work. I, I, it's, I, I, I've been involved for about 60 years, I think. So I've gone through a lot of different situations. But we've always been positive, and, 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 and our men have always been great. You know, I, I, I really, in all the years and all the men that I've worked with and known, I can't think of anybody that I don't like. I mean, I'd have agreed with them all the time. But we were friends, and we could talk. And to this day, uh, I still meet uh, once a week with uh, some of our younger men's club friends here locally. Uh, uh, Norm Kurtz, particularly, uh, keeps a track of me like he's almost like father. But uh, we meet weekly and we sit, we talk, and it's not always men's club, it's just friendship and, and things are going on and, and men's talk. We, we're not sports fans. It's, it's not a matter of talking about the ball games and football games. It's just a matter of our life. So the friendships develop uh, and it, it definitely, we have to do face to face. This computer thing that came along uh, during my age, I think has not helped us any, but it, I think we can overcome it and get around it. I just wanted people to know that they should be sure and, and value these friendships that they're making over these years. Thank you, Jerry. Thank you for that full-throated support. I really appreciate it. That's exactly right. Hey, Rabbi, so one of the things we do, we have some, some weird type of affinity groups besides golf. Uh, in, our, in our my community, we have a program that some guys turned me on to, a Native American relief program. Everyone looks at it and you talk to them and they say, oh yeah, how can I help? How can I help? But what we do is every Tuesday morning, we go to the, the Snoqualmie Casino and we play the, you know, they get four times as many points on, on Tuesday morning. So it was a good day for us. We get breakfast. Uh, we, uh, we, we, we donate some money or we make some money. We, we do, we have a good time though. But in doing so, we found that, you know, we find that we get to talk to each other. We, 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 we uh, sit with each other at shul when we go to synagogue. Yeah, we have a, the back corner. We uh, our friends a widower. We hear you know, learn when his yiskers uh, uh, observances, and we we join him at the minion. And all of a sudden, we're we're in you know we're we're joined together, and we we talk about it, and people enjoy hearing what we're doing, and they also come and join us sometimes on Tuesday morning. So you never know. That's wonderful. That's great. I'm glad to hear that. And having that open environment by which people can come and participate is really crucial. Yeah. That's wonderful. Thank you for sharing that. Yes. Um, let me uh, just address, there were questions. I know people want to go. I just want to honor these questions. Um, <clears throat> so one of the questions, could you please address Hello's existential questions and several Jewish ideas offered as regular practices in terms of the LGBTQIA community? Um, I don't know that I can. I, I don't know that I can offer practices uh, that would best benefit LGBTQIA. I'm really not in a position to do that. 
um, I would speak to an expert or someone who represents that community who can. Um, can I differentiate spirituality from religion? Yes. Um, spirituality is something that uh, makes us feel connected to something greater than ourselves and brings meaning to our lives. Religion offers us a praxis and a discipline by which uh, we feel as if we are making things sacred and taking them seriously. Uh, must you believe in God to call yourself a Jew? No, you must not. Uh, Judaism is uh, not about uh, belief with a capital T of any kind. It's more about deed than it is about creed, right? It's about what we do and the actions that we take much more so than what we believe. We've never been able to regulate anyone's belief, uh, which is why we have so many different beliefs about God. Uh, how do spiritual uh, aspects of men change over time? How different are Gen Z, millennials, boomers, and others? It's a very good question. I'd be very interested to know what types of awareness young men, Gen Z, are growing up with in terms of, you know, what's expected of men and how they should relate to women. Uh, I know that these ideas of, you know, um, taking on less traditional roles as a man, right, are not um, uh, uh, are not pleasing to everyone. There are a lot of people who would rather men just stick the way they are uh, and continue occupying those traditional gender roles. So it'd be interesting to see what they divide up along the generations. And how do we attract younger men to FJMC? Uh, again, I think this is about opening up our programming and creating pathways by which we think that are going to resonate with them. And I think we've got a lot of that to offer, but we have to figure out ways to really market it. Thank you, everyone, very much. To, Thank you, uh, everyone. Thank you. To Bruce and Norwin for putting this together. Thank you all, gentlemen. Thank you very much. Thank and thanks to everyone on the call this evening for your attendance and participation. It means a lot. Thank you.